stocks dip with the declines outnumbering the advances but are of the day's lower auto IT and healthcare are the big drags even as financials and capital good eke out gain. The elevation of a CEO Gopal Vittal to vice chairman in a transitioning CEO designate is a Shashwat Sharma to the leadership role weighs on Bharti Airtel stock even as it posts strong revenue growth on the higher tariffs. JSW Group inks an MOU with Korea's POSCO to set, the, uh, set up a 5 million ton integrated steel plant and explore collaboration on a battery material and renewable energy. Federal bank perks up after slippages dip a 15 quarter low and asset quality improves. Business momentum too remains strong but deposit growth lags. The Secretary of Department of Economic Affairs tells CNBC TV18 in an exclusive interview that 7% growth in FY25 is very doable with strong growth expected in the second half of the year. He also rules out any additional government borrowing this fiscal. Hello, good afternoon. You're watching Business Lunch on CNBC TV18 and I'm Vinny Motiwala. Firstly, a happy Dantheras to everyone, but uh, markets quite subdued in trade, not much of an excitement there. Uh, let's look at what the Nifty is doing. Trading, it was trading with a negative bias the last time I checked, so yes, keeping an eye out on that. Sensex 2 was managing to hold on to some bit of a gain, but as of now, a Nifty was trading with a negative bias. Let's also look at, yeah, see the Nifty is recovered from the day's lowest point. But still, some bit of a negativeness is what we're seeing. Let's pull up uh, what the Nifty PSU Bank is doing. That's managing to hold on to gain. Second consecutive day that we're seeing the Nifty PSU Bank actually managing to hold on to gain. So yes, a 1.6% uptick right now coming in for the Nifty PSU Banks. We've seen a lot of earnings coming in on that front as well. Auto Nifty Auto, that's among the top sectoral losers today. Uh, we are watching out for earnings that will come out from Maruti. Important to watch out there. But yes, that's the top sectoral drag that we're seeing coming in in today's trade. Other than that, we have uh, the Nifty Pharma that's also under pressure today. It's down almost 1.3% uh, in trade. So let's keep an eye out on Nifty Pharma. A lot of pharma companies reporting their numbers. Yesterday we had Sun Pharma, today we have Sipla and tomorrow we have Biocon that will be reporting its numbers. We had Arthi Pharma that reported the numbers, not an exciting set that came in from the company. So yes, as of now, Sipla also is under pressure. So yes, all these pharma stocks is something that we are watching out for in trade. But yes, that's how the market setup is looking like. We have Adani Pots that has just reported its numbers. Net profit is up 40%, margin 62% versus 58.4% last year. It is a bit of a subduedness that we are seeing in terms of the stock right now, but we'll get you more details on that. But it's a day of Danteras and today, and prices of precious metals are trading at record high. Manisha is joining in with us uh, to talk to us about the shine and glitter that we are expecting this Danteras. Manisha, good afternoon. Afternoon and thank you so much for that. Well, yes, it's an all-time high of gold and silver prices, this Dhanteras to you. Well, remember, people buy on Dhanteras or they start something in you, believing that whatever you buy or start this day will multifold, manifold going forward. And it has been a tradition for many, many years. But this time around, there's a bit of a dent here because you are looking at all-time high prices for gold and silver. In the international markets, we've seen gold prices trade above 27 $50 an ounce. In the Indian markets, it's trading at 80,000 rupees or 10 grams on the Anteras today, perhaps 81,000 as well if you add making charges to that. It's the same case for silver also, 12-year highs in the international markets, but the Indian prices are trading at a 1 lakh rupees. Well, last year, the prices were trading at around 70,000, so it has been a huge jump up that you've seen coming for silver prices. It has been strong gains across, and that is because we are looking at uh, a lot of buying in the international markets because of the safe haven buying that gold sees. And this is happening even as there is some restraint that we've seen from Israel and Iran. So somewhat of a war premium seems to have gone down. And then apart from that, the Treasury yields are trading at a three-month highs. The dollar index is headed for a best monthly gain since April 2022. Even with all of this, there is no decline or respite that you've seen for gold and silver. In fact, the traders are watching out the geopolitical tensions in the global markets. It is also about global central bank buying and a lot of uncertainty because of the U.S. presidential elections as well. So you want to stay invested in tangible commodities and what better than gold and silver there. I want to take you through prices on what uh, the prices have been on 
on Dhanteras in last many years. So if I can take you through that, in 2019, we were trading at prices of around 38,000 rupees. And then after two or three years, we've been trading between that 45 to 55,000 rupees. But it was last year that the prices were trading at 60,000 rupees on Dhanteras. And this time around, as you can see, we are at 80,000. So 20,000 rupees per 10 grams of a price rise in the matter of last one year. Also, silver has been rising as well as I told you. Last year was 70,000 rupees. This time is a lakh rupees. And this is what we've done in sense of silver imports into the country. It was at record in 2022, fell in the uh, 2023 because we already had imported a lot of silver. And this year, until now, we've done 7,000 tons of imports already. This is a very interesting chart which tells you that on an average, on Diwali Dhanteras week, we buy 20 to 25 tons of silver and 500 to 800 tons of silver as well. So between gold and silver, the markets do anticipate that this number could go higher in this year. One, because the trust in gold and silver is high. Two, there are various ways of buying it and three with the kind of returns that you have seen come in for gold and silver markets believe that the returns could only go higher going forward okay returns could only go higher it's already gone higher but yes happy dhanteras to you manisha as well and surely keeping an eye out on gold and silver let's move on and other news jsw group and korea asposco group have signed an mou to develop an integrated steel plant in india with initial capacity of 5 million tons per annum the mou will uh, explore collaborations on battery materials related to electric vehicles and renewable energy in india let's move on to another story that we have and sources are telling cnbc tv 18 that the sebi investigation in terms of access max live deal has asked for five clarifications over the term of uh, the deal let's go across to yash who's standing by to tell us the details on the same as well yash well, Vinny, uh, just uh, on Friday, uh, Access Bank informed the exchanges that they've received a show cost notice from market regulator SEBI. And this show cost notice is uh, related to the Access uh, Entities and Max Life transaction, where Access Entities have altogether acquired about 19% uh, stake in Max Life Insurance. Uh, as far as the deal itself is concerned, it was broken into multiple parts. In the first tranche, Axis entities acquired about 13% stake in Max Life Insurance. That was done at a price of 32 rupees per share, after which the insurance regulator had uh, said that the deal has not happened at a fair market value. And hence, uh, Axis uh, Bank as well as uh, Max Financial Services were penalized and uh, the deal had to be uh, revised for the balance part of the transaction. Uh, what we've been given to understand is that that SEBI show cost notice has come down with respect to the same discrepancy when it comes to the pricing of the transaction. And as far as the show cost notice from market regulator SEBI is concerned, it primarily is asking five important questions to Access Bank as well as Max Financial Services. The first question is why was the pricing of Access Max Life deal so discrepant from the transactions which have happened in Max Life Insurance earlier? The second question is was the discounted pricing as far as Access Max Life deal is concerned? done uh, to benefit access bank uh, that's an important question coming from uh, market regulator sebi third one is how did the discounted price which was uh, you know 32 rupees a share for 13 percent stake uh, beneficial at all for max financial services the fourth question is why should it be assumed that the public shareholders of max financial services did not get the right value out of access uh, max life deal and fifth uh, uh, and the most important concluding question that was why no action should be taken against access bank max financial services for hurting the interest of uh, public shareholders of max financial services uh, you know a rough calculation would suggest that if the deal would have happened at fair market value that was done later 113 rupees a share access bank would have had to shell out about 2600 over 2600 crore additional for that 13 percent stake which it acquired Okay, thank you so much uh, for that, Yash. But let's move on and news from the aviation space. SpiceJet has said it has cleared the pending TDS um, dues amounting to around 310 crore rupees up to the second quarter of FI25. And since uh, the 26th of September, the low-cost carrier has cleared over 600 crore rupees in pending dues, including outstanding salaries. GSC liabilities and PF contributions as well were a part of this.
Okay, let's move on and uh, moving on to some news and updates coming in from the primary market front. Food delivery aggregator and quick commerce service provider Swiggy India is IPO is will be hitting the street on the 6th of November and will remain open for subscription till the 8th of November. The issue will uh, consist of a fresh issue of equity shares worth around 4,499 crore rupees and the shareholders of Swiggy will also be selling up to 17.5 crore shares in the IPO. So interesting one to watch out for in this listed space. Obviously, we do have Zomato there and it's competition Swiggy that will be opening up for IPO. Let's move on and talk about the banking space because that's been in focus and we did have Canada Bank that reported its numbers just a short while ago. Now, in terms of what is the fine print coming in for this, let's go across to Abhishek because as of now, the stock is managing to hold on to strong gains, 2.34% gains, Abhishek. Uh, well, like other PSU banks, you know, Canada Bank has lost market share in terms of business momentum. But like PSU banks that you have been seeing, asset quality, one of the best that you are seeing in the last 9 or 10 years for Canada Bank as well. Uh, so in terms of business momentum, deposit growth is 9.3% YOY and about 0.9% uh, sequentially. Loan growth is about 10.3% YOY and about 4% sequentially. In terms of PNL momentum, uh, they have uh, reported an NI of 9,315 crore. We are working with number of 9,312 crore. Their NPA provisions have increased by almost 19, 19.2% sequentially. So analyzed credit cost is at five quarter high of 1.05% versus 0.9% sequentially. But this is not for fresh slippages, but this is more to do with the write-offs that they have done. Uh, so they have made provisions over there. More than 3,000 crore of NPAs have been written off this uh, quarter. So that is why uh, they have made the provisions over there. Uh, they have reported a part of 4,014 crore, we were working with a number of 4,047 crore. In terms of asset quality, uh, gross NPA ratio and net NPA ratio, uh, uh, you know, they have fallen below 4% and 1% respectively for the first time in last 9 or 10 years. So slippages have declined by 30% on a sequential basis. Annualized slippage ratio is at 0.93 versus 1.37%, which is the lowest in the last 15 quarters. So gross NPA and net NPA in absolute value have declined by 6.5% and 16.5%. And on your screen, you can see gross NP ratio below 4% and net NP ratio below 1%. Back to you. Okay, thank you so much for that, Abhishek. Uh, let's keep an eye out on Canada Bank. But uh, on that note, we're going to sip into a very short break, but a small programming note on that front that as we prepare to ring in the festivities this Diwali, tune into CNBC TV 18 at 2.30 p.m. today to hear out the biggest market voices giving their tips on how you can make your portfolio prosper this Diwali. Welcome back. You're watching Business Sanjay on CNBC TV 18. And sources tell CNBC TV 18 that the government is mulling incentives for data centers under the revised policy. policy. And Ashmit uh, is here to give us the details on that. Ashmit? Well, data clearly is king. In fact, a recent DECRA report suggests that the data center uh, in India, the capacity will grow from 1,000 and will double to 2,000 megawatts as early as FY27. And importantly, highly placed sources within the government tell us is that this journey will not be made by the private sector alone. The government is willing to partner. The government is willing to offer incentives. In fact, that was one of the demands that fell out of the recently concluded uh, India Mobile Congress. The government now considering various forms of incentives uh, that can be allowed to the industry to take this forward. Now, uh, what shape and form it will take has not been finalized. There is a consideration that is still underway. Uh, however, there are still some important aspects that we're picking up. Number one, uh, the government is not in favor of granting incentives directly to those setting up of data centers. The government believes that this will uh, skew the incentives in the hands of a few tech as well as real estate players. That is not what the government wants. What the government is in fact thinking is how this incentive can be linked uh, to compute powers that is made available by these data centers to the startup players, to the innovation ecosystem, to the small and medium players. Not just that, uh, this incentive program that the government is working on is also likely to benefit, is also likely to uh, aid in setting up of specialized AI ML data centers, which again have a higher power demand, which have a higher specification. That is something that the government is very keen on. 
as to what shape and form this will take. Well, uh, keep in mind that the draft data policy uh, was brought out in November of 2020, but that was never implemented. Uh, we understand that there is a, a revised version that is currently in the works. The government is considering how to revamp that draft of November 2020, and that perhaps will give more clarity to the industry uh, going forward in proliferation of data centers. Thank you so much for that. But let's take a short break uh, for now. And when we return, we get you updates on some tragic incidents in uh, India owing to the firecracker explosions. More on this story on the other side. Welcome back. You're watching Business Lunch on CNBC TV 18. And we do have Maruti that has reported its numbers. We were expecting a subdued quarter. Now, EBITDA has come in at 4,417 crores. And our expectation for EBITDA was at around 4,690 crores. Net profit, 3,000 crores versus at the poll of 3,779 crores. So, miss seems like coming in on the net profit front. Revenue, uh, better than what we're expecting. 36,962, this is coming at 37,000. So almost in line to slightly better. Uh, keeping an eye out on that one, as of now, 4,417 is what we're watching out for in terms of EBITDA. The stock has taken a bit of a fall. Uh, margins, let's watch out for that as well, because last time the margins were at 12.9%. This time it's 11.9%. A poll was 12.7%. So there is a miss that has come in on the EBITDA margin front. We're seeing the stock also see a bit of a fall coming in. Uh, so yes, uh, numbers don't seem to be uh, a bit of a miss at least is what we're watching out for in terms of the margin front for the company and even the profitability front of the company there seems to be a bit of a miss coming in there uh, other than that you know obviously the expectation obviously was there to watch out for because we're expecting a subdued quarter what are the volumes turning out to be the volumes uh, on a year on year basis that was down by two percent so keeping an eye out of that a better mix because it was what we were expecting, what one was expecting this time. But that seems like that has not happened right now. And we're seeing a bit of a miss coming in on the margin front. Actually, a 100 basis point contraction is what we're seeing on the EBITDA margin front for the company. What's also important to watch out for, you know, how is the demand outlook shaping up for FY25 and this festive season? We'd heard some bit of a concerns coming in around festive season. Now, how is that actually going to be shaping in from the company? We'll reach out for some comments that maybe we could watch out for from the company in terms of that. As of now, our numbers are a miss. The stock is down 2% in trade. And uh, we'll also bring in some bit of a reaction that we're watching out for in, uh, and uh, on what Maruti is expected uh, and how these numbers are being read by. But let's move on. And we also have Prakash Divan to talk to us about the same in terms of Maruti's numbers. Prakash, good afternoon. First cut seems like Maruti has missed the estimates of the street, at least, and what we were looking at in terms of CNBC, especially on the margin front. What are your uh, What is your outlook in terms of the numbers? How are you reading it? So, yeah, I know while this might be a disappointment many as compared to the consensus, uh, but personally, my take is that Maruti has gone through a phase of... Uh, consolidating a lot of its production and operations, uh, but hasn't had any new launches. Uh, the last significant launch that they had was the Fronks, which has taken off quite well. But after that, uh, nothing much has happened, especially on the hybrid portfolio. So the conventional uh, product portfolio that they have, realizations, if you see, they've not been able to pass on higher prices or move up the value chain, and that's, that's where the margins would definitely get impacted. Uh, and, and to be honest, uh, there's not much of a restocking on festive season on account of the festive season that usually happens by this quarter, or at least starts getting you some semblance of restocking. So uh, let's see if, if quarter three goes off well, then then there could be a little bit of a pullback. But otherwise, uh, it could it could consolidate or struggle a bit uh, for the next six months in this zone. Absolutely. Maybe it could struggle a bit because right now the stock is down 4%. Prakash, uh, like you were mentioning, festive season doesn't seem to be too exciting. Um, is that a concern coming in for other players as well? Or maybe it's just Maruti because of the reduction in terms of launches or not too many launches there for the company? So, you're right. You know, it is a, it is a phenomenon that's driven more by the competitive intensity in uh, segments that Maruti usually has been known to lead. Uh, if you see the, you know, if the market share retention itself has been a challenge for them last uh, couple of years, uh, 
uh, with the likes of Kia and Mahindra uh, eating into a lot of the market share. And their SUV portfolio also, if you see, hasn't really, as I said earlier, not many launches, not new products. The chimney has been a little bit of a disappointment uh, in terms of, of course, it's a, it's a different segment. It's not supposed to be mass, but it hasn't been able to, uh, you know, move the needle for them. So, it's a competitive intensity related thing. Uh, all of them are facing that. Even Hyundai has uh, uh, not been very successful in terms of new launches. So we'll have to wait. Uh, typically, what what will happen is Motown is uh, looking at a transition, and it's there's a little bit of a confusion amongst consumers whether hybrids are better, whether it's pure EVs that are better. Or you would still go with the good old IC. So in in that process, a lot of decision deferment happens. And that's exactly why the festive season is not kind of taken off uh, very well, as in it's likely to be subdued. Okay, yeah. Festive season surely is uh, subdued. But Prakash, I just want to understand, right? Like, why we talk about consumers being confused about it. Do you think uh, the update on EV timeline model launch, that is also something that maybe could give in some bit more competition to Maruti Suzuki and that could be some bit of a pressure point for Maruti going forward? Yeah, I mean, they, they definitely are much late in, in the EV value chain. Uh, they, their reliance on hybrid uh, was far higher, and, and there there's a dependence on Toyota. So, and Toyota is constrained by capacity, uh, uh, you know, of output. So they've really not been able to play a very significant role in that, unlike other markets where hybrids have been far more dominant very quickly. So I think Maruti will have to relook at its strategy, and I'm sure they will. They will. They will be doing that. They would be doing that. Uh, what's good about uh, their production is uh, that the Sanan unit is completely operational. There's a lot of export orientation that's built in there, and once they are clear in what segment they want to play a major role in, they probably be able to uh, focus on that. Uh, so that, but that these things take time. I, I would give them at least two quarters for for the reset to happen. Sure. Okay, we have Ashwin Patel also joining in with us from LKP Securities. Ashwin, good afternoon. Uh, what are you making also of the f uh, first cut in terms of the Maruti numbers? Uh, seems like a miss coming in on that front. How is it with your estimates? Yes, uh, the numbers have clear, clearly been a miss uh, from our estimates as well as as well as from the margin uh, from the market estimates. The margins uh, have come uh, below estimates at about 11.9 percent. Though the revenues in the top line is uh, uh, quite quite in line with uh, uh, you know the estimates, but uh, the clear miss is on the uh, uh, you know on the margin front. Uh, we can say that uh, the the uh, uh, the passenger vehicle industry is going through a lot of of uh, slowdown currently and that is getting reflected in Maruti's numbers being the market leader and uh, market share also uh, must you know uh, is also facing uh, 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 challenges because of uh, uh, other players and uh, overall slowdown and uh, uh, the EV pack is doing slightly better and they are completely I mean they are uh, quite strong on the hybrid side and the CNG side so uh, I think that demand is yet to uh, you know hybrid pick, uh, demand is yet to pick up CNG is doing good but uh, overall on the, ma uh, the the small car segment that is not performing well and that is contributing about 39-40% of their total volumes so uh, you know big dent is coming from that front also the SU and the growth that we had seen last year is slightly uh, getting moderated. Uh, so that uh, being one of the major segments for Maruti with their uh, 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 their model pipeline and existing uh, models, uh, that is also one, another challenge for them. So on and on, uh, I would say that uh, it's it's not a great set of numbers from Maruti this time. Yeah, not a great set of numbers and do you think, you know, there may be this subduedness that we're seeing passenger vehicles facing a bit of a, you know, glitch right now. Do you think that would lead to some bit of a downgrade or EPS cuts at least for Maruti as of now given that the numbers are not anything exciting? I think so because uh, uh, you know there is some pressure in the urban markets. Some uh, there is a, there is a growth on the rural front, but uh, there is a lot of pressure on the urban markets at this point in time. And uh, uh, if if the uh, you know the margin performance, we'll be waiting for the commentary and uh, getting an outlook on the overall industry going forward in the second half and FY26 as well. Uh, so uh, you know based on that as well, I think uh, uh, markets will be uh, uh, revisiting their numbers and maybe some. Uh, downgrades uh, uh, is possible. Okay. 
uh, some downgrades may be possible. And uh, Ashwin, just a last word. I want to understand that, you know, could we expect similar trends or numbers coming in from other passenger vehicle companies or maybe Maruti because they have less of these EV options right now? Uh, I think for uh, companies like Tata Motors, uh, you know, we can see some uh, uh, similar kind of uh, trend in the domestic markets. Also, JLR is not uh, doing that, uh, you know, fantastically great. So, you know, for Tata Motors, we can see, uh, and also on the uh, commercial vehicle side where they are the market leader, there is also, uh, you know, uh, still a negative territory they are into. So, I think uh, uh, for Tata Motors, at least, uh, I may uh, we may see these kind of numbers. For but for Mahindra. Maybe we can see slightly better numbers considering their strong dependence on the UV portfolio, which is still doing better, not as great as it was doing earlier, but uh, still there is a lot of growth over there. So maybe like for Mahindra and also for uh, on the tractors front, we may see some sort of uh, uptick uh, going forward. Maybe this quarter we may not see, but going forward on good monsoons that we have seen this year. Uh, so maybe, uh, you know, going forward, uh, Mahindra's uh, numbers uh, in this quarter also, they may see, uh, we may see better numbers from from them and going forward they'll be better placed than the other two. Sure, thank you so much uh, Ashwin as well as Prakash for joining in with us for a quick take in terms of the Maruti numbers. But let's get in more internals in terms of the Maruti numbers as well. Sudarshan is joining in with us to give us a breakdown. While numbers have been a miss, Sudarshan, what are the internals looking like? So following the trends of the sector, another company has reported a weak set of earnings. Mouth is Q2 earnings are below estimates. Profit has missed estimates by almost 18%. Revenue has missed estimate by almost 6 to 7%. Just if you not, uh, uh, talk about the numbers, profit is down 17%. Revenue is flat. EBITDA has fallen 8%. Margin has come in below 12% after like a few quarter. So overall numbers are below estimates as well as down area. But now the question is why the numbers have come below estimates. First, low volume volume is flat year on year and there's a minor jump on a sequential basis even if you uh, see realizations it's flat year on year and on sequential basis again it's down and talking even and these numbers have come in below estimate despite seeing a minor improvement in the gross margin but more importantly uh, more than uh, more than these numbers what management says about the festive demand that's what people will be uh, people will be wanting to know because that's the reason that all the auto companies in the last few months first Bajaj Auto TVS last month when they released the numbers they were talking about the first half of the festive season where Bajaj Auto had talked about the demand growth was in the range of one to two percent then after the TVS motor came out and said that demand has made a minor improvement and it was in the range of four to five percent so now all the would be on Maruti Suzuki. What do they say about the demand? Because that would be the main focus. <clears throat> absolutely, you know, that's going to be the main focus in terms of commentary. Thank you so much for that, Sudarshan. But with that, we are absolutely out of time on this edition of Business Lunch, leaving Maruti with a decline of 6% as of now. Thanks so much for tuning in.